Come with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. A lot of people think that God's not into coffee, but there's a, Bible called, uh, a book in the Bible called Hebrews, <laughs> which is a really terrible joke, isn't it? It's Father's Day. I thought I'd got to bring out a dad joke. <laughs> Hebrews 11 verse 6. The title of my message today is Divine Ecosystems. Divine Ecosystems. Let's read this. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, But without faith... It is extremely difficult. Excuse me. But without faith, it is somewhat cumbersome. Sorry. But without faith, it's quite a challenge. Sorry. Without faith, it is. Come on, somebody. It is. It is impossible to please God. It is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that A, He is, and B, that he is a, it always goes quiet there. Uh, the reason it goes quiet there is because I, I honestly believe that there's been some, some not so wonderful theology that's been kind of given. I got saved on a beach, so I didn't have the privilege of growing up in church. My father was an East German atheist. Uh, He was a soldier on the wall between the East and the West, and he got into the West by running across a minefield after a two-year stint in a uh, a, a gulag, a concentration camp, for plotting or pondering what it would be like to live on the West in capitalism and get out of socialist communism. And uh, and so I didn't grow up with any faith. I didn't grow up with any church. I didn't grow up with the Bible. I didn't grow up with any religion. So uh, everything that I've experienced is, is... my theology just comes out of what I've learned from walking with God. There's a lot of people that, that know that God is, but they're just not sure that He's a rewarder. Uh, they, you know, there's a, there's a theology that God, you know, saved you, but reluctantly. Like He would have been just as happy if He would have burned in hell for all eternity. But He gave His only begotten Son. And just as well, now that you're saved, don't expect anything else. That's all I'm doing for you. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if God would not withhold His only begotten Son, how much more will God give us all things that you may enjoy life? See, if God said, listen, I'll give you my Son, but I won't give you a great life. I won't give you a beautiful spouse. I won't give you children. I won't give you a nice home or a beautiful car or then that would elevate those things above the Son of God. I've got to tell you, there is nothing above the Son of God. When when God gave His only, it wasn't His only, it was the finest. There, There was nothing greater God had in heaven than Jesus. And you better believe that God so loved, He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life, and that's just the beginning. Jesus says, behold, I am coming, and my reward is with me. Faith is not just believing that God is. Shift your faith today and believe that he is a rewarder. When you start trusting God, you better believe he'll reward you. When you start choosing God, you better believe he'll reward you. Every time I've chosen him above myself, reward. Every time I've chosen him above sin, reward. Every time I've chosen him above my flesh, reward. Every time I've chosen to be obedient to him, even though my mind, my own understanding was saying, no, no, go left, don't do that, that can't work. How can that work out? And I've chosen to go with the word of God, reward. Those who come to God must A, believe that He is, and B, that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. How many people thank God right here, right now, that God is a rewarder? I'm telling you, your best days are in front of you, not behind you. So I I chose this, this, well, actually, I didn't even choose. I felt like God gave me the title of this, this message called Divine Ecosystems. Because all the way through your Bibles as you read, which we always encourage, uh, you'll read that Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God. 
The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. A lot of people think the kingdom of God is heaven. Heaven is not the kingdom of God. Heaven is part of the kingdom of God. But Jesus said, if I cast out demons here on earth, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. He sent the disciples into the cities saying, go into these cities and preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, so even though heaven is part of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is wherever Jesus is Lord, wherever Jesus is king. Can somebody say amen? Now, you need to understand that just like if you move from Intel to MacBook, there's a different operating system. When you are born again, you are born again. You've escaped the matrix, but you, you're now in a, in a new experience and you have to relearn things. But this is not that. The way that you operate in, in the world is not the way you operate in the kingdom. The kingdom has its own ecosystem. God is a God that created systems. God is a God that created systems. I have a hard time with evolution, number one, because it doesn't work. You couldn't have evolved over billions of years because you have a number of systems that needed to be intact, in place on the very first day. For example, you have a respiratory system that couldn't evolve over time. It, Otherwise, you couldn't breathe. If you can't breathe, you die. So, okay, the respiratory system. Then you have a digestive system. When you eat, it digests the food, pulls out all the nutrients and gets rid of the, you have had to be there from the very beginning. You have a cardiopulmonary system, blood running through your body. You have a, a muscular system. You have an immune system. There are, there are 16 highly complex systems that are firing God created Adam from the dust of the earth, all the systems intact, and then God <sighs> breathed into Adam the breath of life, and Adam became all the systems activated, and you become a living. God, God is a God of systems, the solar system, weather systems. A weather system, and these systems are self-sustaining, self-sustaining. Every, every day, the ocean gives up billions of gallons of water. Every day the ocean gives billions of gallons of water. Those waters go up and they, they form vapor that become clouds. Those clouds elevate. As they elevate, they precipitate. The precipitate is, a, is, is, is rain. The rain falls on the mountains. It goes into streams and brooks, becomes the rivers and flows back into the ocean. But because of this cycle, because of this system, because of this ecosystem, everything lives. The ocean, if it withhold, everything would die. But the ocean knows that for life to, to happen, it has to give. For life to happen, for God to love the world, He had to give His only begotten Son. So when you come into the kingdom, you have to unlearn some of the things that you learned. The, the prophet Yoda said to Luke Skywalker, hmm, you must unlearn some of the things you've learned. I can't find his book in the Bible, but that's a pretty powerful statement right there. So today I wanna to give you three quick thoughts on what it is to be part of God's divine ecosystem. The first one is this, is it's called the test trust operating system. In this life, till Jesus splits the sky, you and I will, will be in a flux. You and I will vacillate between two positions all the time. You will either be in a test or you'll be in a trust. God, God, God will test you, but the test is not designed to exclude. The test, God's tests are never designed to exclude or to fail. God's tests are always so that He can determine the level of trust. God tested him with five talents. God tested with two talents. God tested with one talent. His agenda was to see what he could trust them with. The guy with five talents, Master, you gave to me five. Look, your five has produced five more. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over 10 cities because you passed the test. I'm going to trust you with influence. I'm going to trust you with authority. God will test you with responsibility to determine how much He can trust you with authority. Never ever trust someone that has authority and doesn't take responsibility. 
Let me just say this, it's very naughty and I may not ever be invited back. I have a hard time, I have a hard time when I go to cities where the people in power are perfectly happy to live with the homeless in destitution, in addiction, in poverty, languishing, because my Bible tells me that the level of my responsibility is the level of my authority. But wickedness wants authority without responsibility. The spirit of Lucifer is he wanted authority, but he doesn't want responsibility. What I love about your pastor is he says, I love my city. I love my people. I don't care about so much about the platform. I don't care about the lights. You can tell why God has given this man authority. It's because he takes responsibility for his city. He stands in the gap. He wars and he fights. It's called the test trust operating system. God will test you with, with faithfulness. The Bible says in Luke 16, there are three, three specific tests. He'll test you with what belongs to another man before he'll give you what is your own. He'll test you in what is least. You don't understand, pastor, I'm called to be a worship leader. Pastor, you don't understand. I'm called to be a preacher. I believe that I'm an apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic, pastor teaching powerhouse. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, right now we need someone to change diapers in kids' church. Oh. I don't do diapers. <laughs> See, the Bible says, if you can't be faithful in what is least, who will give you what is much? Jesus is in, in a, 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 an upper room. And the Bible says he, he disrobes, girds himself with a towel, and then he begins to wash the disciples' feet. As he's washing the disciples' feet, he comes to Simon Peter, and Simon Peter says, stop, stop, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? And, si and Jesus says, Simon, what I'm doing, you, you don't understand. He's like, dude, dude, you know, I know all this pressure. I know you've been talking about betrayals and Romans and Gentiles and crucifixion and rising from the dead. We're not sure what that means, but, I, but, but dude, get a hold of yourself. You're the man. This is for slaves. They have slaves that, that, that wash feet. This is beneath you. Jesus is like, Simon, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And he says, well then, wash my hands and my head. He says, whoever is bathed is already clean. I just need to wash your feet. See, if Jesus couldn't wash the filth from the feet in an upper room with nobody around, do you really think he could pick up a cross carry it to a top of the hill where he would be nailed to that cross by Romans to wash away the filth of your sin and my sin on a cross. Jesus knew for God to trust him with that. He had to be tested in that. If you can't be faithful in what is least, who will give you what is much? So, so this test trust. Let me just say this, the level of authority, the level of success, the level of influence in your life is not determined by, by, by God, it is determined by you. God is always testing, God is always testing. His testing is always to see, can He trust? Can He trust you with another level? And once you move from test to trust, God will now bring you back into a test to see, can He trust you with more? God is always wanting to elevate, God is always wanting to bless. In Genesis 22, He comes to Abraham, and he says, Abraham, Abraham, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Abraham waited a hundred years for this boy. He believed God. And the Bible says that his faith in God that at a hundred years old and Sarah being 90, he didn't consider, consider the deadness of his body nor the deadness of her womb, but counted God faithful who had promised. And this faith was accredited to him as righteousness. And he got his reward. He got Isaac. But if you know the story, God spoke to Abraham and He said, get out of your tent, look up, count the stars if you are able. More will your descendants be than the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Abraham had received one, but the vision and the promise was for multitudes. God changed Abram's name from Abram, exalted father, to Abraham, father of multitudes. And yet he has one son. So God says, I want you to take that one son 
and want you to offer him as a burnt offering on an altar. In your seed, Isaac, your, your seed will be blessed. Whatever you give to God multiplies. Whatever you withhold from God perishes. Abraham, the next morning, saddles his donkey, rides three days and puts Isaac on the altar. And God blesses Isaac. Isaac has Jacob and Esau. Jacob has the 12 patriarchs. And a nation is born from one man's faithfulness. You need to understand that there's the test trust. God is always testing because God is desiring to trust. The level of trust is determined by your last test or your present test. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of people would, used to always ask, and I did this when I first got saved, I read the Bible and I read about Adam and Eve eating from the forbidden fruit. And I'm just like, God, I'm not an expert, but maybe if you didn't put the tree in there, <laughs> hello, or at least, or at least put electric fence <laughs> that if they want to sneak in there in the night, zai, they get zapped. Or, or, or what about gate? Like put a moat with gators in it, like snapping gators. Or, or, uh, or what about sharks with like machine guns on their back? Or I, I don't know. But God, who supposedly knows the end from the beginning, puts a tree in the garden that they're not meant to eat from. Now, how many people you kind of jog it in the park and you see, you know, a, a park bench and it's got the, the, the sign on there, don't touch wet paint. You kind of... Ah! <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's something about the forbidden. So I'm like, God, why would you put... And it took years for, for, for God to show me why he left the tree in the garden. The tree was in the garden because in Genesis 1, God said to Adam, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue, exercise dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. God wanted Adam to have authority. To have authority, you must be under authority. Authority flows most powerful with their submission. Submission means sub under a mission. God put the tree in the garden saying of all the trees you can eat, you can freely eat, they're all free, but this one is mine. I need you to tend it. I need you to care for it. I'm not putting it on the outskirts. I'm not surrounding it with a moat. It's gonna be right in the middle of the garden to remind you that I am Lord. It gives you an opportunity to be in submission, to recognize that there is one higher than you, that even though you are great, Adam, you are not the most high, that there is a most high above you and that your authority, the devil knew if he can get them to eat from the tree, he could pick up and swoop in and steal the keys to authority over the world. The, the, the first test is the tithe. Because the tithe is like the tree. That the first tenth belongs to God. But it's in my hand, it's in my possession, it's in my garden, it's in my proximity, but I have to see that it doesn't belong to me. I have to see that this is not seed that I can eat. That this fruit of my labor belongs to Him. I found that when I got into the kingdom, I was not able to pay all my bills on 100% of my income and then I'm sitting in church and that horrible pastor starts talking about tithing and I'm like, how can he get up there and talk about doesn't he realize I can't even pay all my bills with 100% and he's talking about giving 10% to God. I can't, but, and then I began to discover that as I honored the Lord with the first fruits that he blessed the 90%. When I had 100% working against the curse, it was a ne never enough. But when I took 10%, it moved 
The 90% under the blessing, 90% with the blessing of God is greater than 100% working against a curse. It's called the test, trust, operating system. Number two, the culture of the kingdom of God is honour. The culture of the kingdom of God is honour. If you and I were to go into heaven right now, we would hear the angels saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let me just say, someone who was born in Germany, grew up in Australia, lived in New Zealand for seven years, and now is not just living in America, but three years ago became a citizen of the United States of America. Thank you. That there is no country like her. That there never has been a country like her. Well, she's not perfect. Exactly, because there's people here. <laughs> just like there's no perfect church. Because there are people, and people aren't perfect. If they were, Yeshua HaMashiach wouldn't have had to come and die. But He came and died because we ain't perfect. <laughs> However, America is still the first nation to bring aid to other nations when they're in disaster. America is still the first nation to fund other nations that are in struggle or are rebuilding in turmoil. America is the only nation that was a superpower that never used its superpower to dominate other nations, but rather chose to liberate other nations. America is the only nation that has, has spilt her own blood, her own treasure, not just here in this land, but in lands, foreign lands, to depose dictators. To, to depose tyrants who oppressed, ensnared, and, and destroyed the, their people. America has done that again and again. America is an honorable nation. We honor success. We champion success. In America, we believe that everybody should have equal opportunity to succeed. Because America is a land that has honor, the, the closest to heaven, no wonder God has blessed this great land. I have a problem with, with people that disrespect those who have put on the uniform. I have a, I have a problem with, with, with people in government that disrespect our vets. I have a problem with people that, that show, show no regard, that are indifferent to the young men and the young women that daily put on the uniform, whether they're firefighters, whether they're police, whether they're army, whether they're navy, whether they're Navy SEALs, whether they're Marine, whether they're Air Force, they put on the armor so that you and I can enjoy freedom. I have a problem. I have a problem when people don't honor. But I got to tell you, it's a Luciferic spirit because what I experienced when I came to America, the first time we came to America, we live in San Diego. We went to SeaWorld and we, were, we got there early for the Shamu show when they still had the Shamu show. And we were sitting there and then the, the, the young lady, as the place got filled, she says, is there anybody here that you have family that are currently serving in the military? And the, the place gave a standing ovation. I couldn't help but weep. I'd never seen such honor. Down under, Australia was, was uh, born in uh, 1778, America, 1776. We're two years younger. Both of us came out of England, but from England, they sent their convicts. They sent their criminals. That's why we have a, a word called mate. G'day, mate. How you going, mate? We call everybody mate because the criminals, when they finish their time, the crown didn't want to transport them back. King George didn't want to bring them back to England, so they left them down under. And so when somebody got out and they wanted to start a business, they would go to the local bank manager, and the local bank manager's like, well, you know, you're, you're, you're an, you're an ex-con, you're a thief, but hang on, so were you. So we pull everybody down to, yeah, you know better than me, mate. We're all mates, we're all in this together. And that Aussies have a problem celebrating success. But here in America, we celebrate and we honor success. That's why God has been able to bless America. Let me tell you, where honor is, blessing is. Where honor is, blessing is. Jesus in Mark 6 comes into his hometown, his hometown. 
And the Bible says he could do no mighty work in his hometown, save he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled at their unbelief. That's what Mark writes. But Jesus actually opens the commentary and he says, truly I say to you, a prophet is not without honor except here in his home country. Jesus, because of a lack of honor, discovered that the culture was one of unbelief that shut down the power of God. The reason the devil wants to fill America with dishonor is because where honor is, the power of God flows. Where honor is, the blessing of God flows. And the devil knows for him to enslave people, enslave man, to put his trust in man, he's got to get rid of the benevolence of God. He's got to get rid of the blessing of God. He's got to get rid of the power of God. But I thank God for churches like Legacy Church that understand the principles that we will honor God, we will honor of those who put on the uniform. We will honor the flag. We will honor our men. We will honor women. We don't judge people by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. We are men and women of honor. And because we honor, we reflect heaven. And because we reflect heaven, Legacy Church looks like heaven on earth. Can somebody say amen? The fifth commandment, there, there, are, there are 10 commandments. The fifth commandment, the first, command, the first four are to do with God, the next six are to do with man because six is the number of man. The fifth commandment, the very first of those six is you shall honor your mother and your father that it may go well with you and you live long in the land. The Bible calls it the first commandment with a promise. Honor your mother and your father. For years I thought, well, that doesn't apply to me because my father, like his father before him, was a violent, abusive alcoholic. My father ran away from home when he was 14 because his father was, was always drunk and always beating into his, his that then stepmother and kids and him. He ran away from home. The problem is, Jesus said, whatever sins you forgive will be forgiven you. Whatever sins you retain will operate and reproduce in you. My father became the very epitome of the thing that he despised. He hated his father because he was a violent, abusive alcoholic and he became a violent, abusive alcoholic. And I got saved on a beach. When I got saved, my goal before I got saved was when I turn 18, I'm gonna beat my dad's head in. That was my goal. I remember at 15, coming, my dad coming home from, from the club and he was so drunk. And mum said a few things and he just, he just lost it. And he started beating into my mum. And I was the eldest of two boys and I thought, I've got to protect mama. So I tried to protect mama and he knocked me to the ground. And he was in a blind rage. I still remember looking up and it was like, it was like there was a demon inside of him. His eyes, he was vacant. And he picked up a chair and he went to smash the chair over my head. Would have killed me. But thank God the, the legs of the chair hit the wall and took most of the, the, the sting before the chair hit me. I remember crying in my room after the beating, feeling like I was a failure. For 30 years, I lived like I'm not, I'm not man enough because I made inner vows of that moment. But I remember saying, just saying, when I turn 18, when I turn 18, I'm gonna beat my dad. When I'm physically strong enough, I'm gonna beat his. Instead, at 18, I got saved. I met Jesus Christ on a beach. So what I did was I disowned my dad. I thought, well, you know what? I'm just gonna disown him. I'm just gonna, and God's like, you can't do that. You gotta forgive him. I'm like, uh-uh-uh, I ain't forgiven. Number one, he ain't asking. Number two, he don't deserve. And God's like, when I saved you, you weren't asking and you weren't. I'm like, all right, all right. Do my how many people know God's always right? And so it took three years. After three years, I said, all right, all right, all right. I'll forgive him. And God says, too late. I'm like, what? He says, I want you to tell him that you love him. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I have never heard those words. They've never been spoken over my life. And you want me? He's the dad. He should go first. And God's like, no, I saved you. You're the cycle breaker. Then a few years ago, God said to me, I need you to honor your father. I'm like, okay, I'm done. I'm done. I did the forgiving thing. I told him that I love him and yes, I felt something shift and break on me and over him. Yes, all right, it's working. And, uh, but this, hang on, 
I said, all right, God, I'll honor him, but name one thing that he's done that's honorable, and I'll be quite happy to honor him. And God's like, I'm not asking you to honor him for something that he's done. I'm not asking you to honor him based on his performance. I'm asking you to honor him based on his position. And then he says, look at the commandment. And I read the commandment. He says, honor your mother and your father that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. He said, Jürgen, in your relationship with Leanne, have you noticed how just like that you'll, you'll lose, lose your, your fuse? You'll just fly off the handle? You, this anger? Where does that come from, do you think, my wife? He says, and then there are just certain blocks in your parenting with your, your boys, with your sons. Where do you think that comes from? I'm like, I, I don't know. And God says, you need to honor your father. He says, the dysfunctions in your life come because you have not broken the cycle. So I said, God, hang on, I don't understand. How does me honoring a man who never lived up to what I perceived he ought to have, how does me honoring him, and God says, watch this. He says, Jürgen, Every cell in your body bears the DNA of your father. When you reproach him, you reproach you. When you judge him, you judge you. When you dishonor him, you bring dishonor onto you. When you honor him, you bring honor onto you. When you bless him, you bring blessing because every cell in your body courses with the de None of us arrived first generation. Today is Father's Day. For many people, Father's Day brings up all kinds of emotion. For many of us, it brings up pain of a father that wasn't there or a father who was but was distant or was absent or a father who was there who wrestled with his own demons and many times those demons were inflicted on you. But I want you to know today you can not only be saved but you are saved to be the cycle breaker that the generation coming after you never has to live with the things that it finishes here, it stops here. Because of that, my children have grown up in a home where they've never seen their, their father raise a hand to their mother. But they've seen modeled a, a, a father who loves their mama, who cherishes their mama, who honors their mama. They've heard from little kids, I love you. I am proud of you. You can do anything. You were born a winner. You can do, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. You're the cycle-breaking generation. It operates through honor. The last point, number three. Number three is faith. Faith is literally the, the currency of the kingdom of heaven. Everything that you get in heaven is through faith. A woman grabs the hem of Jesus' garment and Jesus says, who touched me? And the disciples are like, dude, the whole crowd, everyone. Hello? He's like, I didn't say who was thronging. I said, who touched me? I felt power flow out from me. And the Bible says, a woman came trembling saying, for 12 years I've suffered. I've spent everything with doctors, no better, but grew worse. And then I said within myself, when I heard about you, Jesus, I said, if only I can touch the hem of his garment. Jesus says, daughter, your faith has made you whole. This woman stole a miracle. Jesus was not aware. He was aware that power had left him. And he stopped. And he says, power left me. Who touched me? He was, and then the woman came trembling, realizing, now, was Jesus, even though he was unaware, he wasn't unwilling. I'm telling you, the power of God is healing. The power of God is salvation. The power of God is deliverance. The power of God is freedom. But it was faith. Jesus says, when I return, will, will I really find faith in the earth? He didn't say, when I return, will I find love? He didn't say, when I return, will I find peace? Will I find a kindness or acceptance? He says, will I, when I return, will I find faith in the earth? <clears throat> the devil hates faith because faith draws the power of God and brings the miraculous. He hates faith. 2020, the devil unleashed fear. Fear on America, fear on nations. Still, still today, nation, there, there are people still struggling in fear. 
Fear of a pandemic, fear of death, fear of contagion, fear of. The Bible says that where fear is, three things can't exist. The Bible says God has not given you a spirit of fear, but one of love, power, and a sound mind. Fear and love can ex- cannot coexist in the same space. It's like Clark Kent and Superman. Can't be in the same place at the same time. The Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. When we saw fear rise in 2020, what else did we see? We saw love dissipate and we saw chaos. We saw Antifa, we saw violence, we saw hatred, we saw hostility, we saw buildings turning to the ground, we saw people being beaten up. We, we, we saw the worst. Fear, love, power. People felt powerless and a sound mind. People are rational. People so, so irrational around. I tell everybody that, that I don't believe that, that um, you know, COVID is, is, is Chinese. I, it kind of looks more like it came from the British aristocracy, darling. No, no, you, you think about it. You know, we're COVID, darling. Okay, our assignment is we're going to, we're going to you know, pounce on people and, you know, obviously tank their life, darling. Um, oh, here comes somebody now. No, stop, stop, they're wearing a mask. What? Yes, I, I know, I know we can, I know the smallest molecule, yes, I know we can, but no, no, we're British, darling. We have decorum. We won't attack them. While they, I know that the masks are just, just go with it. They're wearing a mask. We operate on a code. We're not going to attack them. But as soon as they take those masks off, fair game, darling. No, no, what are you doing? You can't, no, no. They sat down, they sat down to eat and remove them. No, 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 we don't, no, 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 darling. No, we don't. If they're sitting and eating, far be it from us. Yes, yes, a question? Yes, on planes. No, that's right. Yeah, they're not socially distanced, are they? Um, yes, yes, you can. Oh, no, no, sorry, no. When they remove their mask, they're eating peanuts. No, no. <laughs> No, no, part of, our, part of our decorum, darling, is we don't attack. Anyway, so, <laughs> sound mind, sound mind, sound mind, sound, doesn't make any rationale. So watch this, let, let me finish, let me finish. In, in 2005, when, when we started our church in San Diego, we started our church, I didn't know anybody, and, uh, but I knew, I knew I needed the blessing of God, and so I felt God say, I want you to honor the Dream Center in L.A., and I want you to send 10% of everything that comes in to the Dream Center. So every week, whatever came in on a Sunday, I would write a check on Monday and send it to the Dream Center. Every Monday, Dream Center, 10%, everything that came in. I did that for five years, every Sunday. And I remember getting a phone call from Pastor Matthew Barnett, who runs the Dream Center. And he's like, man, we keep getting these checks from you. Man, you're a church planner. We ought to be sending you money. I'm like, Matthew, this is just what, you know. And what I didn't realize was that my oldest son would be getting bullied in school. Getting bullied and getting beaten up every day in high school is not a fun thing. They made fun of him because he was a good looking kid, but he had an Australian accent. And all the girls thought it was cute. And the guys didn't like him having all the girls' attention. So they decided we're just going to beat him up till he cries. Well, if you can't beat him, join him. So he joined them. And then they made him their drug mule. And out of Tijuana came a a drug called black tar heroin. It's black tar and they lace it with opiates and you you light it and it has a a smoke, a vapor that comes up and you inhale it. It's cheaper than marijuana, cheaper than pot, but a thousand times more addictive and lethal. And we found that we had a 16-year-old kid who was so heavily addicted to opiates that when we took him down to the police station, they found that his fingerprints matched a number of break and enters and he had to go into a juvenile detention center. I remember holding him and he was crying, saying, Dad, I tried everything to beat this addiction. I can't do it. I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to live anymore. I just want to kill myself. I didn't know what to do. But then I remembered it from 2005 to this point in 2010, we'd been sending 
10% to the Dream Center. So I called the Dream Center. I said, do you have anything? They say, have anything. Bring him up tonight. We'll call the, we have a deal with the juvenile detention centers that if they come here, they can do their time here and we'll put him through our discipleship. He went to the Dream Center and got completely set free. It broke the back of that addiction and set him free. If I can put his photo up last year, he married his sweetheart. That's my daughter-in-law, Raquel. He got married to her last year. He's a regional manage, manager for Legacy Soul and he's prospering. She's one of our worship leaders and dancers in our church. And I was sharing this story saying, how good is God? I had no idea that faith, faith tells you that when, when you give, it doesn't leave your life. It leaves your hand, but it never leaves your life. It leaves your hand where it goes into your future, where it multiplies and comes back to deliver. Jochebed released a little baby, three months old, called Moses. She released him to God, but Moses didn't leave her life. He just left her hand, but he came back, pressed down, shaking together, running. He comes back as a deliverer and he delivers mama, papa, brother, sister. He delivers an entire nation from bondage. And God said, I didn't just do that. Put up the second photo. This is my second son, Ash. God said, when you started sowing into the Dream Center, you had no idea that, that from the Dream Center would come salvation from drugs and suicide for your elders. He said, but the young lady sitting there, her name is Aubrey. It's now Aubrey Matesius, but before that it was Aubrey Barnett. He said, not only did I deliver your firstborn, he says, but I provided a bride for your second born. When you step into this divine ecosystem, there are things that God will test you that may not make sense. But if you'll adopt a posture of honour, it's the culture of the kingdom. And as you step out in faith, you have no idea. Things may leave your hand, but they never leave your life. They come back, pressed down, shaken together, running over. The God that we serve is a good God and He is a rewarder. Come on, somebody. He is a rewarder. He is a rewarder. He is a rewarder for those who diligently seek Him. I'm out of time. Would you close your eyes and bow your head? I wanna pray for two lots of people today. If your life's not right with God, friend, today is your day. If you're away from God, far from God, come back to Him. If today you're like, well, I, I, Jesus is in my car. Well, today I wanna to encourage you to listen to another wonderful prophetess, the prophetess Carrie Underwood. Just let Jesus take the wheel. It's a scary thing. You let Jesus take the wheel and you ride shotgun because you don't know where He's gonna turn next. I gotta tell you, for 35 years, I've let Jesus take the wheel. Oh my, 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 what an adventure life is. The worst thing I've ever done is try to take the wheel back. Let Jesus take the wheel. If you're here today and you're far from God, friend, the good news is you don't have to leave the same way you came in. You may have come in broken. You may have come in far. You may have come in with sin, with shame, with guilt, with remorse. I want you to know today, you can leave cleansed, forgiven, all shame lifted, restored. If you're one of those categories, you've never given your life to Christ. You once did, but you've worked, walked away. You're far from God, or you've never actually let Jesus take the wheel. While every head is bowed, every eye closed, I wanna say a prayer for you so that I know who I'm praying for. If you're one of those four cats, would you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me, pray for me. I'll see your hand and I'll pray for you. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you, darling. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, darling. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Who else there? Thank you. Once I see you, you can put it down. Thank you, thank you. Who else is there? Just lift it high so that I can see it. Thank you up there. Thank you up there. Thank you up there. Who else is there? I feel like there's someone else. Thank you on the side. God bless you, sir. Thank you, sweetheart. I see your hand. Is there somebody else? Is there somebody else? Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you. I see that hand. Anybody else? Thank you up there. I see that hand. Thank you up there. I see that hand. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you on the side. Thank you on the side. Thank you. Anybody else? 
So beautiful, so beautiful. I'll wait just a few more seconds. I wanna pray for one more group of people. But if there's anybody else, quickly just raise your hand. Thank you, darling. Anybody else? Thank you, thank you. Church, can we do this? We're gonna stand to our feet for a moment. The band is gonna sing a beautiful worship song in just a moment as we come to a close in this service. I wanna do two things. I wanna invite those of you that raise your hands in just a moment to grab a friend or someone that you came to church with and come down here. We've got these beautiful ladies down here who have got Bibles. And the Bible is, is a gift from this church to you. You, you may already have a Bible. Still come down and take one because you may find somebody this week in a coffee shop, in a hair salon, nail salon, or at work saying, man, life, man, can you figure it out? You can say, actually, I was at a church on Sunday and they gave me the manual to life. When you get a new car, it comes with a manual. When you are born again, get a new life, it comes with a manual. It's called the Word of God. And so, Come down and get it. If you brought someone that raised their hand, offer to walk with them. If you brought someone that should have raised their hand, why don't you, you bring them down? Come on, let's put our hands together for all of those that raised their hands. Would you begin to just find the aisle and come down and we wanna give you one of these Bibles. We wanna give you a gift. If you're sitting with someone that raised their hand, offer to walk with them. If you're sitting with someone that you think raised their hand, could have raised their hand, should have raised their hand, would you bring them? We're gonna pray for them. Just wait right down here. I'm gonna pray for you guys in a moment. But I wanna pray for, I wanna pray for you today because it's Father's Day. It's Father's Day. The first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the equivalent of, of our A, B in Hebrew is the Aleph Beit. I know it's, just hang with me for a second. Aleph Beit, A-B in Hebrew spells Ab, which means Father. The first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet spell the word Father. The, the A, the Aleph, is symbolic of ox or strength. The B, the Beit, is house or family. So the Hebrew word for Father literally means the ox or the strength of the house or family. Now watch this. Jesus in Luke chapter 11 is teaching. And He says, when a strong man fully armed guards his house, his goods are at peace. But if somebody wants to plunder his possessions, he must first bind the strong man and take away his armour then he is able to plunder the house. If the strength of the house is the Father, no wonder the devil has waged war against fathers because he knows that the Father is the ox, the strength of the house, and he can't touch what's protected unless he first binds the strong man and takes away the armour in which he trusted. There are so many of us who are living with pain, who are living with brokenness, who are living with resentment, who are living with shame, who are living with dysfunction because the enemy took out our fathers. And we are, but I'm telling you, God is raising up a brand new generation. God is raising up a brand new generation. And I thank God for a church that elevates fathers. Did you know that, that fathers, the absence of fathers is the number one predeterminer of whether children will graduate from high school. Illiteracy rates drop when there's no father in the home. Promiscuity rises when there's no father in the home. Drug addiction rises when there's no, teen violence rises when there's no father in the home. Dysfunction rises when there's no father in the home. Alcoholism rises when there's no father in the home. Depression and anxiety arises when there's no father in the home. The devil knows if I can take away the, the, the strength, if I can take the ox, if I can take this out of the home, I can plunder the house. Well, devil, we say to you no longer in Albuquerque, everything's about to shift today. Everything's about to change today. So would you do this with me before I pray for you beautiful people. Church, I want you to lift your hands. Every single one of you are here because you had a father. 
But not every one of you may have grown up with that father. Not every one of you may have been fathered by that father. I have good news for you. The disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. John the Baptist taught his disciples to pray. And Jesus says, when you pray, say. When you pray, say. When you pray, say, our Father. I want you to know that you have a Father in heaven. And the word of the Lord to you today is every area and any area where your earthly father failed, where your earthly father lacked, where your earthly father left a gap, your heavenly father will fill. The Bible says he's a father to the fatherless. He's a husband to the widow. Father, I thank you right now. So say these words out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, today I choose to honour my earthly father. I forgive him of all the mistakes he made. Today I choose to let go of any violations that he made against me. I forgive him. I set him free. And I thank you that I set myself free, that honour and blessing come upon my life in Jesus' Name. Amen. Now would you, come on, give the Lord a praise. And now would you stretch your hands out towards these beautiful people. I'm so proud of you, darling. So proud of you, sir. Stretch your hands out towards these beautiful people. I'm going to get you to pray this prayer out loud. Everything is about to change. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Come on, let's all say these words with these beautiful people. Say out loud, Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank You today that You sent Jesus Christ, Your only Son, to die on the cross to take away my sin. Lord Jesus, thank You that today I am forgiven. I am clean because of Your sacrifice on the cross. Today, heaven is my home. God is my Father. And I have an incredible future in Jesus' Name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.